to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the writer of the book of hebrews said it is appointed a man once to die and then the judgment and after that judgment the scripture teaches we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ that each one may receive the things done to the body according to what he has done good or evil the fact remains that one day I will leave this life. One day you'll leave this life. We'll stand before the almighty throne of God and we will either hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, you worker of iniquity. We invite you today to listen as we think about in our study the truth about heaven and hell. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast we encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons on our program, they'll be made available to you free of charge. You can contact us through our website or by calling the phone number given at the end of our broadcast. And as always, if you've got a subject you'd like to study further, you've got a Bible question, whether it be related to salvation or Bible matters, We'd love for you to contact us by email or calling us, and we'd love to help you study that matter through God's Word. And always, as always, we encourage you, visit the local Church of Christ in your area. You'll find people there who are concerned about what God says in the book and concerned about the souls of mankind. Today we think about a very sobering, and a very serious subject. Friend, it is the case that I am one day going to leave this life. You're one day going to leave this life. James 4 and verse 14 says that may be sooner than later. What is your life? It's but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. The Scripture teaches at best I've got 70, maybe 80 years upon this earth if I'm lucky. Psalm 90 verses 10 through 12, and that time will fly by before we know it. What am I doing? And what are you doing to prepare for the other side? Friend, do we realize that's what life is all about? Someone has rightly said that this earth is just simply a veil of soul making. I am here for my one chance to get right with God and to make sure that I can live with Him in that beautiful place called heaven. And so today we want to we elaborate from the Scriptures and we want to think about what does the Bible say about that, that place called hell, a place of destruction, so that I can be discouraged from doing things that will lead me there. And what does God say about that beautiful place called heaven so that I can be encouraged to live right and enjoy the beauty and splendor of that place called heaven with Jesus, with God, and with all the saints of all. So let's direct our attention to that place in the Bible that we know of as hell. For when we live in a world today that doesn't like to mention or think about the idea of hell. But to fail to think about hell is to fail to put a pivotal part of encouragement in my Christian walk. Here's what we mean by that. If I never think about hell and the consequences of bad decisions, then I'm more prone to make those. But if I'm cognizant, there is a place called hell. If I don't live right and do right, there's a very serious reality that I can go there. Friend, that encourages me not to do the things that will lead to that place. And so we want to take today a brief journey with a man in the Bible who went to a horrible place in Hades known as torment, which is indicative of what hell itself will be like. What's that going to be like? 
Notice in your Bible, Luke chapter 16, and we begin reading in verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there's a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed from the crumbs with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. Likewise, Lazarus is evil, Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted, you're tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to there Cannot, nor can those from there to pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. What do we know about the rich man and his journey to that place we think of as hell? We know that for him and for those who go there, hell is a place of horrible torment. Listen to Luke 16, 23 again. The Bible says, And being in torments... In Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. This man awoke and he was in horrible torment. Can you imagine the idea of torment? When we talk about torment, we're talking about unbearable pain. We're talking about that which uh, creates mental, spiritual, psychological havoc in one's life. Uh, uh, imagine being so sick that you wished for death, but always living. Imagine having so much pain that you longed for the day it would finally go away, and that day and that moment in time continuing forever. Friend, that's the idea of torment. Unbearable pain and anguish and heartache for all eternity. Who would go to a place like that if they could help it? Secondly, as we think about this man and his journey to torment, the Bible teaches us that it was a place of unquenchable fire. Notice Luke 16, 24 again. The Bible says, Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You know, when I think of torment. And I think of the anguish this man was in. Can you imagine it being so bad you're just looking for one drop of water? I've been pretty thirsty before. I've wanted a glass of water, a drink of water, but one drop of water? That's the extent of torment this man was in. Can you imagine being in the fire of hell for all eternity? Now someone says, well, how can God cause someone to be on fire for eternity but not be burned up. Well, number one, God, the creator of fire and of mankind, has that a power, but He's shown us that before in the Bible, has He not? In Exodus chapter 3, Moses looked up and he saw a burning bush, but the bush was not consumed. It was on fire, but it never burned up. Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were thrown into the fire. The men who threw them in were consumed by the fire, and they themselves were not. God, who has power over fire, has the ability to cause one to suffer in that fire for eternity. Now listen carefully. Does God want that? Absolutely not. Here's what God wants. God wants all, wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. 
God's not slow about His Son's coming, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want somebody. He doesn't long for. He's not enjoying that idea. But for there to be reward, there must also be punishment. For there to be right, there must also be the justice of those who have done wrong, for justice to occur. And God indeed wants people to be saved. Now, as we think about this man who went to this horrible place of torment, we want to illustrate one of the worst things this man had to face. This man had recognition in hell and what a horrible thing it was for him to remember. Hell is a place of mental recognition. Listen to Luke 16, verse 25 again. The Bible says, But Abraham said, Son... Remember, listen to that word, son, remember in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus' evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. What two words echo out of that verse that remind us of the horrible nature of hell? Son, remember in hell my memory will not be erased. In hell, I will remember what I should have done, could have done, thought I would have done, but did not do. I think the, that theme song in hell that will be so horrible is, if only I had. I could have done. I, I, wouldn't it be horrible? Friend, listen carefully. I understand the torment, I understand the fire, and I understand how horrible that will be. But if a child of God is lost... I think this might be one of the greatest things, most horrible things about hell. The very fact that I was a Christian, the very fact that my sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus, that I had the grace and mercy of God, and I gave all that up for temporal, carnal, mundane, worldly things, and let sin take that from me. If a child of God is lost, how horrible would it be for them to be lost in hell, ever remembering at one time they were saved. Friend, it'd be, you'd be hard-pressed to find anything more horrible and tormenting than that idea. As we think about hell, let's also realize this. The Scriptures teach that hell is a place of eternal separation from God, from that which is good, from others who've done right, and from those things which are holy. Listen again to Luke 16, 26. The Bible says as, as Lazarus is seeking for someone to come over and give him a drink of water, or as he's seeking someone to go back and teach his brothers, Abraham says, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. What about when we get to the other side? Any making changes then and crossing back over? No. Once this life ends, my fate is set. Once this life ends, there are no more chances to go to the other side. If I awake in torment, I cannot cross over to paradise. If I awake in paradise and you wouldn't want to, you couldn't cross to the other either, Abraham said. It's eternal separation. Imagine that. Being separated forever from God, from good, from Jesus, from holy and right people, being with forever the devil, the demons, the ungodly, the immoral, those who are carnal and worldly minded of this world. You know, when we think about the eternal nature of it, sometimes it's hard for us to really grasp that idea. Let me use a couple of illustrations. Let's say that someone had done something in this life, some heinous crime, and they were given a life sentence without parole. Now, even that has a glimmer of hope, does it not? Even without parole, it has a glimmer of hope because a person still may turn to the Bible, may change their ways, and there is a day coming when they will pass from this life and they can still mend their ways and get to heaven. Even a life sentence in jail has hope of something on another day, being the day of their demise. Friend, when we talk about eternity, 
There's no day of hope. There's no glimmer. There's no sunshine spot anywhere in that. It's all darkness and veiled by the fact that there will be no other chances. And so let's realize hell is a horrible place of eternal separation from God and from those who have lived right and done right in this life. But now let's think about the other side of that equation. Let's think about Lazarus and the rich man and how Lazarus, although he didn't have much in this life, he was a poor beggar. He was eating crumbs from the rich man's table. The dogs licked his sores. He didn't have hardly anything in this life. Yet on the other side, he had it all. Friend, we want to encourage today by noticing and by thinking about the beauty of that place called heaven. What will it be like? What encourages me to live right, to follow Jesus, to, to fight the fight every day against sin and Satan? Oh, it's that beautiful place called heaven. What's heaven going to be like? Heaven is a beautiful place of rest. You ever get tired in this life? You ever get hot? You ever sometimes just think, what? I really need to rest. I need to sit down in the easy chair. I need to take it easy for a while and just kind of relax. Heaven is a place of spiritual rest. Listen to Hebrews 4 verse 9. The Bible says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Rest from what? Rest from our labors. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 58 and 59 Rest from the fight and the struggle against sin and Satan. All that will cease to exist. Rest in the sense that we are in the, the safety, the shelter of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Rest from our cares, our worries, our burdens. Real rest can only be found in that beautiful place called heaven. When we think about heaven... Let's also realize this. In heaven, there is the absence of evil. That's one of the things that makes heaven so wonderful. Listen to Revelation 21, or notice Revelation 21, verse number 4. The Bible says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. You know, when I think about this verse and all the absences that will make heaven great, th think about just some of these things that won't be there. There'll be no more tears. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You know, when I think about this image, I think about an illustration from my own life. Uh, my, one of my grandmothers on my dad's side was, uh, I guess, a woman kind of from a different era. She grew up working in the home. Every morning when she got up, she put an apron on. She worked in the kitchen, worked in the house, helped the family. And I can remember we would go and stay with her certain times. And I can especially remember times when we might fall down or bump our knee or get a scrape somewhere. And she would always take us up in her arms so lovingly, so tenderly. And she would take that apron and wipe every tear out of our eyes. What a picture of, of comfort and security and hope. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now listen to this. Here's some of the absences. There'll be no more death. You'll never have to weep or go to a funeral again. No sorrow. I won't feel sad anymore. No more crying. No more pain. All the former things that passed away. Look at how wonderful heaven will be because of what won't be there. The very things that break our heart. The very things that bring us sadness and, and turmoil and difficulty. In heaven, those things will not exist. What else makes heaven great? Friend, this is the top thing. And if the rest of this were never told, this is all we would need. What makes heaven great? Heaven will be great simply because God is there. I used to think that it were the streets of gold, the, the pearly gates, the, the river of life, the, the tree that is eternal of eternal life. The, those things used to appeal so much to all the jewels and the sardis and the diamonds. And as I, I read those things, I used to think that's what makes heaven great. 
That's not what makes heaven great. God is what will make heaven great. Listen to the words of Jesus. This is what makes heaven great. Matthew 6, verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be Your name. What makes heaven great? God's there. God is the source of all love. 1 John 4, verse 8, He is the God of light, as the book of 1 John teaches. He's that which we long to be, to conform ourselves to, and He's everything that is representative of good, holy, right, and perfect. If God's there, we're in heaven indeed is a place every child of God ought to want to go. But then we also mention this about heaven. What else will make heaven great? Heaven will be great because everything I suffer in this life, the Bible teaches heaven will be worth it all. This is a passage that has often encouraged me as a Christian. And I want you to notice what Romans chapter 8, verse number 18 says. Paul said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What's that passage say? Heaven will be worth it all. The sufferings that I face, the, the, the trials, the tribulations, the cares of this world, the worry and the anxiety that we all sometimes have, they, they don't even begin to compare. They're not a drop in the bucket compared to how wonderful heaven is going to be. Heaven truly will be worth it all. The sickness, the sin, the sorrow, the heartache, the struggles that we face, fighting the good fight every day, it's all going to be worth it on the other side in heaven. Friend, I'll assure you, if you follow the Bible, if you live your life according to the teaching of Christ, if you obey the Gospel, become a Christian, continue to walk in the light, remain faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10, heaven will truly be worth it all. But friend, let's also realize this. If one chooses or is tempted to follow Satan, follows down the path of sin, lives a life of immorality and ungodliness, remains in that lifestyle and is lost, I can assure you there would be nothing worse that you could imagine than being lost in hell forever. Friend, I believe this with all my heart. If we can just get a small taste, a small glimpse of how horrible hell is really going to be, nobody would want to go there. We'd do everything possible not to go there. And in that same vein, if I can just get a small taste, just a, a, a brief glimpse of the wonder and the beauty of heaven, every person living would do whatever it took to get to that beautiful place. But friend, only the individual can make that decision for themselves. The Bible does say it's appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. I'm not designed to live forever, nor are you. The sad reality is one day I'm going to leave this life. So are you. And when I leave this life, I will meet my Maker. I will return to God. And based on obedience to the Gospel and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'll either hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord, or I'll hear the words, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Friend, we ask you today to consider seriously your eternal state. If it all came down right now, where would you spend eternity? Maybe you're not sure. Friend, we want you to know today what you need to do to be sure. Jesus said in John 8, verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. You can know truth and truth can make you free from sin. What must a person do to be saved, become a Christian, and be on the road to heaven? First, You've got to hear God's Word. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. I've got to realize this book 
is God's message on salvation and it and only it has the words of eternal life. John 6, verse 68. Once I've heard the Word, I have to believe it. Jesus said in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Having believed in Jesus, I must be willing to change my life and repent. Acts 3 and verse 19, Peter preached, repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out. I've got to turn from sin and turn to God. Having repented of sin, the Bible teaches one must confess Jesus as Lord, as Son of God. Jesus said so plainly in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, If you won't confess Me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess Me before men, I'll confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Have you made that great confession? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you've done all that, if, if you've heard the Word, you believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, you're willing to make that good confession, have you done what Jesus said to be saved concerning baptism? Jesus said it so plainly. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Jesus said, you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved. Mark 16, 16. When the first gospel sermon was preached in Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up with the eleven. The, Gen uh, the Jews cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We've realized we've killed our Messiah. What do we need to do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Jesus said in John 3 and verse 5, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then once I've obeyed the gospel, I've got to do my best to walk in the light. 1 John 1, 7. I've got to be faithful unto death. Revelation 2, verse 10. I've got to change my life and walk in newness of life and try every day to follow the Lord to do what He wants me to do, to repent when I find things in my life that are not right. And so, friend, our prayer and encouragement and hope for you is that you will go to heaven. God wants all men to be saved. We want you to be saved. If you've never obeyed the Gospel, won't you become a Christian today? If as a Christian, maybe your life's not right, make that right. Take the time to make sure today you're right with God before eternity comes for each one of us. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.